my town is a lesion on the hide of Great Britain. It's the sort of place that might be pleasant if it weren't in the north of England, and had completely different people. But it is, and it doesn't, so... You know, rubbish. For years, the only truly redeeming feature of Yeastwick was the new Tesco, a grocery store to the Yanks. The new Tesco isn't actually new, and for the past decade it hasn't been, but when the old one burned down in a satanic ritual gone horribly as expected, and they built a new one up atop the ashes, the name seemed appropriate. It stuck because the new Tesco is more exciting than the Tesco, I think, maybe. The reason the new Tesco was great can be captured by a common enough exchange. All right, Mick, I might say. Tommy, how's the family? Mick might respond. Mom's drunk, Dad's dead, Beck's pregnant and 17. Right, Mick might add, laconically. I'm nicking a Heineken and a Maltesers. Nicking equals stealing. Right, well, don't get caught drink driving. Fantastic, right? I love Mick to death. He's like a dad I could love to life. But Mick hates his job. I've never met a man so completely committed to getting sacked who nonetheless doesn't. It's really gotten to the point of vocational parody. And I am absolutely not discounting the possibility that Mick is a hostage of the Tesco Corporation. He has a trafficked sort of despondency about him. But when he's not working, he's usually getting pissed down at the gift horse. That's a pub. Anyway, like I said, the new Tesco was a quality den of minor villainy. Now it's... I'm not so sure. A temple to surrealist fuckery, maybe? And it's got everything to do with a dodgy fucking antelope that appeared one day like a nasty whitehead in the hard cartilage of the town's ear. But the town, being the open sore that it is, actually welcomed the bougie deer. Mental. That brings me to Remy and the kebab cart he moved into the front of the Tesco. Remy's French. His surname's Lacroix. Remy Lacroix. Like the hula-hooping porn star queen of the beleaguered look-back. And until the new Tesco decided to get weird, he sold spliffs out of his Volkswagen and made subversive YouTube videos about why no one should drink oat milk. Rennie's a bloody vegan, so how surprised was I to see him shaving lamb donair off a spit like a fucking professional? I was with Algy and Rosie when I first saw the meaty new addition. In any other town, the three of us might be rightly considered a street gang, but in Yeastwick we're just irksome youths who were raised by ordinary, negligent parents. Algae is short for Algernon, a posh name for a morally impoverished man. Rosie's fit and a bit of a slag, but she's excellent people, and she can put back a pint with the best of them. Algy stared at Remy's cart with more confusion than could be normally found on his lovely brickish face, and then he asked the question that the rest of us were thinking. Who'd you stab to get the cart? Remy smiled pleasantly, which was off-putting in a way I can't put words to. Oh, I did not steal it. It was a gift. From the council. Unfucking likely For anyone not from the UK, how nice for you. But also, a council is basically like a, a local government. In practice, it's like a pay toilet with a broken door. It takes your money, it obstructs your pursuit of bliss, and it's typically full of shit. They don't give out kebab carts. And they certainly don't give them to drug-dealing vegan Frenchmen. Mm, but why? Rosie asked Remy, quite Socratically. Remy waved at a sullen mother and a noisy child as they entered the store, and then he returned to the question at hand. Uh, to make room for the antelope. The antelope? Now, I, I don't speak French, and Remy says things like, That night we take the MDNA was so funny. Which means he took and fun, but he had something wrong. An antelope is like a deer, mate, I said with just a whisper of snark. Oh, no, no, it is much better than that, you will see. He kept smiling, quite a bit like Buddha, really, which did the work of convincing me that Remy was just high on something. Algy noticed, too. Are you taking something new, like some French hallucinogen? Is it good? Have a taster for us? Algy was a bit thick, but he knew how to ask an important question. However, Remy said he was sober, which seemed a bit of a stretch. But he was smiling. Maybe he had found Jesus. Or maybe Jesus had found him. Or maybe his new French hallucinogen really was good and had convinced him that he was a kebabist. 
I had settled on the ladder, possibly, as we got to the refrigerator. And then I saw something strange. It was filled with nothing but cat. Is that grass? I mean, it was filled with nothing but grass. Rosie was right, and I needed to take a break from Eritrean off-duty shops. But more devastatingly, Rosie was right. Grass. Long fucking bundles of chilled grass. Like the type you would find in a field, but not the sort Remy sold. I was perplexed, unnerved, and I suspected that Mick had finally lost it, so I went to stage an intervention. Mick. Thomas. Thomas. What the fuck was happening? You, Mick, are a beautiful lunatic, but a lunatic all the same, I accused, pointing a finger perhaps more menacingly than was warranted. But this is too fucking much, mate. Tommy. Rosie started in, but I was too incensed to be polite and respond. Where is the beer, Mick? Grass? Fucking grass? I uh, found a 1664, Algy offered in. But Tommy. Cronenberg 1664, French piss. I fucking screamed, and the noisy child from earlier heard and got more noisy. The sullen mum, though, total babe, went startled instead of dour. I cracked a cheeky grin. She frowned. My miserable weariness hardened like concrete around my head. Stop smiling pleasantly, Mick. I'm in a crisis here, and I cannot change my lifestyle if you get sectioned. Bloody fucking grass? Wait, why did everyone seem so happy? Why was hot mom putting grass in her shopping trolley? Why was noisy child so quiet all of a sudden? Had I finally succumbed to mental illness the way my dad always said I would, before he was mauled to death by that improbable Barbary lion? My mind felt mired in the possibility. Tommy! Algy and Rosie shouted together. What? Rosie looked shaken, and Algy was holding a now half-empty 1664, clearly beside himself with grief. It's all grass. Or mostly, Rosie squeaked. I disembarked from my tirade long enough to actually look at my surroundings. Once again, she was right. Aisles were stacked haphazardly with bunches and bundles of grass. The floors were littered with the leavings of it. And I watched in disgust as a man in a flat cap sniffed a blade, nibbled, and made a face as if to say, mm, That'll do nicely in Marjorie's stew. The new Tesco was now a hostile place. I noticed that as Algy said, Gift horse? Rosie nodded eagerly. Oh, God, yes. And I sunk in sour mourning over a once great institution of our terribly wanting community. Any grass for you lot, then? Mick asked finally without a dry fucking gram of humor. I grumbled, and then I passive-aggressively grabbed the only sweet I could find on the way out. A lion bar. And they always reminded me of my dad in a not-so-good way. It was a haunting treat, but in the moment not nearly as haunting as any fucking grass for you lot. Jesus Christ. By the time we got to the gift horse, I was thirsty and huffing and possibly dangerous. Things only got worse when I saw the sign that hung over the door. Someone had gouged away the word horse and sloppily painted antelope over it in bright red letters. Fuck me. Rosie refused to enter, which was probably smart, but Algie and I were brave for her. I left her my lion bar wrapper so she wouldn't feel abandoned. She started in on a Marlboro, the first of many, I suspected, and Algie and I entered, quite prepared to do violence if it came to that. Whatever I was expecting of the gift antelope, it certainly wasn't a usually rowdy bunch of drunkards and reprobates dressed like one and all were angling for a place of high esteem with a local vicarage. They were still loud, still watching football, but their kit was just bizarre. There was three loggers, Nige, Algy said, leaning his workhorsey frame on the bar. Nigel, the barman, pulled three elegantly predictable pints, though a bit more clumsily than usual. After, he took Algy's money, but I swear he almost looked relieved, even with Algy being short 20p. Uh, no milk, then? Nigel asked. Fucking what? Pardon, did you say milk? I asked, feeling a spasm jerk my face into what I assumed was an ugly look. Babies drink milk, Nigel. And when have you ever... Nigel suddenly swept his eyes down the bar and I followed them. The drunkards, the church boy reprobates, they were, to a man, cradling pints of ever-so-slightly greenish milk. 
It turned my stomach. A tap in the ribs from algae turned my eyes. He mouthed, What the fuck? And I was right there with him. This was either the world's most elaborate wind-up or our town had well and truly lost its mind. Nigel, what's with the antelope sign? Algy asked uneasily, and as if competing with Algy for who could pull the most distressing facial expression, Nigel's face chose haggard fear. This time, his eyes darted to the patron nearest me, a man called Stephen, whom everyone called the Duchess instead. I turned my head slowly toward him and found him grinning cartoonishly at me and Algy. I can't stress how shit this town is usually. People don't smile. It was a jarring thing to see so much in one day. All right, Dutch. He cut me off. The antelope is a fine, majestic creature, isn't it, Thomas? Such power and grace as it bounds and prances through the fields. Some antelope eat meat, and their regal horns are often mistaken for nature's... This time I cut him off. Shut your fucking mouth, Duchess. He didn't. I punched him hard in the nose. He started bleeding like his face was the Trevi fountain of a nasal injury, but just kept yammering on like David Bloody Attenborough about how great antelopes were. And then I realized that the murmur of background conversation was all antelope talk. They pondered aloud about whether there was a best way to brush an antelope, whether an antelope forward on Man City might make the team more resplendent, whether it might be possible for a man to be born of an antelope mother and walk unknown amongst the world of disgusting humanity. And then abruptly, with chilling synchronicity, they all went silent. A moment later, they began to hum. I turned to Algy, who had finished his pint and was on to mine. Algy looked frightened, but Algy was looking at Nigel, and Nigel looked terrified. Nigel had fought in the army. Nigel had once thrown a bottle of brandy at a man who tried to rob him, and then set the man ablaze using a votive candle. Nigel wore an almost Prussian mustache that made him look like a man who could sort any problem with a headbutt in a cold glare of stony masculinity. But as the patrons hummed, Nigel raised his right arm above the bar and I saw the reason for his earlier clumsiness. Nigel was right-handed. Or he had been. Now he had a stump at the wrist, wrapped in a blood-soaked tea towel. Nigel? I exhaled before inhaling a long and quite unsettled silence. Nigel was looking to the door, pale as a ghost and nearly as insubstantial. And then I heard a scream outside. My eyes shot to Algy, whose own eyes had followed the same instinct. We shared a silent exchange. Rosie, Algy's eyes suggested. Indeed. My eyes agreed. Then, with a shifting for a brow, I conveyed. But the danger. Nigel's missing hand. He seems scared. Luckily, I typically carried a knife. This day was a typical one, at least in that regard. I brought it out. Algy armed himself with a wooden stool, and once again I thought morosely of my dad. Then Algy nodded in a way that might have been resolute, if not for the panic. I nodded back. And then for about 20 seconds, we joined each other in what might be best described as tribalistic hyperventilation. Let's go get our girl, Algy murmured like the quiet hero that he was. I gripped my knife handle tightly and tried to look mean instead of deeply worried. Then Algy kicked the pub door open and we stormed into the street and... Fuck. Rosie, no! Algy screamed, dropping his stool and running towards the remains of a body in the street. Three twisted limbs two legs and an arm, were the only recognizable parts of a headless corpse whose torso looks like a mince pie ten seconds into a starving man's meal. I looked away, down at my feet, and jumped to the side as my gaze found the other arm. Algy was openly weeping, trying to scoop bits of human gore back together, as if the death and mutilation of our friend was something that could be fixed. But then I noticed something as my eyes once again found the severed arm. The tattoos were wrong. So were the bracelets on the wrist. Rosie? I shouted. I heard no answer but began to meander about brandishing my knife like the stinger of an angry wasp. Then I yelled to Algy. It's not her. The tattoos are wrong. 
Algy curiously lifted the arm nearest him by its middle finger and studied it. And then he looked back at me as the threadbare relief washed over his snotty, tear-jerked face. And then I saw surprise and joy as he stood and trundled over toward a spot to my right. Rosie had been hiding near a hedge that ran along the front of the pub, clever girl that she was, and Rosie chirped as Algy lifted her off the ground in a rib-straining hug. Only Rosie didn't seem to share Algy's exuberance. She hung limply from his arms and stared off into the distance. I looked at the mangled body in the street. It hadn't been Rosie, but Rosie must have seen it happen. And whatever had happened didn't seem like the sort of thing that a moment of happy reunion would allow her to unsee. Oh, poor Rosie, I thought. But with our band of miscreants reunited and physically safe, if psychologically battered, we fled the scene as quickly as our legs would take us. We made for Rosie's flat as it was the closest. And once inside, I put a kettle on as Algy tried to amuse the trauma out of Rosie. It took quite a while, but she drank tea well enough, and afterward, we moved feverishly quickly to a mostly full bottle of peppermint schnapps and a half-smoked spliff. It was only with a healthy dose of toothpasty cordial and cannabis in her, and the comfort blanket of an unopened packet of cigarettes that she began to talk. It was this thing. The, the antelope, maybe, that did it. She said, her hand shaking the flame of her lighter into a disorderly cigarette ember. I saw Mary Conover walking in the street, and I, I thought her dress looked rather smart, and then that thing rounded a corner and came up behind her, quiet like. Mary Conover, Algy sighed. I always fancied her. I thought I had a chance, too. Aw, babes, Rosie responded. You definitely did. Algy smiled half-drunkenly, and we raised a toast to Mary before Rosie continued with her grisly tale that now felt strangely heartwarming. I don't know how tall an antelope is meant to be, but this one had legs as long as Algy's body, and it almost looked like it was tiptoeing on its tiny little feet, like it was sneaking. I called Mary's name, and she turned, and, and then she saw it and, and screamed. Rosie swallowed another draught of schnapps. It's weird. As much as an animal can, this one seemed almost disappointed when Mary realized it was there. And then it kind of trod on her. As, as soon as she fell, it lowered herself down and started chomping on her belly. After she finished, no one spoke. We drank and smoked in silence, each of us trying to make sense of what was happening through a mercifully thickening haze of intoxication. We all slept at Rosie's that night. I was the little spoon, Rosie the middle one, and Algy the big. But my sleep was plagued by a recurring series of disconcertingly antelopian dreams. In them, I was an antelope, grazing in a field of wiggling fingers and bushes made of human hair. I felt the weariness of an antelope, the fear of predators, and the hunger that, when sated, kept me sane. I shit where I stood and occasionally had disturbingly horny thoughts of antelope sex. And then a panic rang through the herd like a stiff breeze. There was a lion nearby. I knew it, and an antelope beside me that I knew to be my dad in a dream logic sort of way knew it too. When the lion bolted out from a nearby thicket of swaying human legs, I ran. But my dadelope tripped, and the lion got him. When I awoke, I did my best to shake off a lingering hunger for grass and told no one about my nocturnal insanity. And then together we resolved to go back to the pub and save Nigel. He seemed unaffected by the town's obsession with antelopes, and he was a good bloke that we had heartlessly abandoned. And he had a missing hand, which we all agreed may be the sort of thing that might require a doctor. So with what armaments could be scavenged from Rosie's flat, we set out on a mission of valor, or, that was the idea. Our middling courage was quickly stifled as we walked out the front door and heard, The humming began right after the door opened. A moment later, we saw the source. The whole bloody town seemed to be gathered in the street in front of Rosie's flat, all of them completely nude, staring blankly toward the sky and swaying gently with their arms stretched into the air. Algy put on a bewildered, gargoyle-ish scowl, 
and Rosie whispered, What the fuck? Are they trying to be... Because they almost look like... Grass. They almost look like grass. I shivered despite myself, and I tried not to delve into the implications of this mass hysteric piece of performance art. I needed to retain a scrap of boldness for the benefit of my friends, and for our wayward barman. So I swallowed my considerable unease, and we headed into the throng of human vegetation. In truth, it wasn't entirely dissimilar from moving through the front bit of a concert, vast numbers of exposed willies and fannies notwithstanding. The humming persisted, though, growing louder the deeper we went, and with all the upstretched arms, it almost felt as though we weren't meant to see or hear our surroundings. Buildings loomed along our flanks, but the street ahead was a complete fucking mystery, and I was less than thrilled. Then the whispers began. Near enough to be heard, but swallowed into obscurity by the sheer number of possible sources. The humming ebbed, and a voice said, We are grass. We are heard. The next utterance was the same, but it had the addition of a few more voices. We are grass. We are heard. The frequency of the voices increased as we neared the pub. The humming began to subside, and it was perhaps 200 feet from the pub that I saw the first pair of severed legs on the ground. Blood clung to the naked bodies nearby. Next, there was a loop of entrails hanging from the shoulder of a woman called Penny Wentworth. I didn't see a body to go along with it. We are grass. We are herd. We are grass. We are herd. We are grass. We are herd. The chorus of voices began to repeat the chant incessantly, and then we saw the sign for the pub. There was another new edition scrawled in messy red paint. For the... Gift for the antelope. We hurried inside. Algy made for the bar. Rosie lit a cigarette, and I looked out the window. I wish I hadn't. I wish the field of human grass had remained an innocuous strangeness, albeit one peppered with bits of gore. But as I looked outside, I saw no more raised arms. They were all facing the pub. Dozens of faces all frozen in the same terror-stricken grimace. Guys... I said, strafing in front of the window and watching as scores of panicked eyes followed my movements. Tommy? Rosie said from behind me. There's something wrong with Nigel. There's something wrong with bloody everyone, Rosie. I replied. But I shut the blinds on the pub's front window and turned around at Rosie's urging. As always, Rosie was right. Algy was standing, tightly wound, a few feet from the bar back and clutching a bottle of whiskey. His priorities, as per usual, were in line with the welfare of our trio, but he looked decidedly out of sorts as he gazed behind the bar at Nigel. Nigel was on the floor atop a sprawling, nearly familiar phrase painted in large, messy red letters. We are grass. We are heard. Beyond the revelatory, homophonic clarity, there was Nigel's unnerving theatrics. He was naked, scampering about behind the bar on all threes and occasionally stopping to lick paint or puddles of clotted milk from the floor. As if that weren't enough, he or one of the patrons had stapled two crumpled paper cones to his forehead. Horns. Nigel was an antelope now, and well beyond our help, it seemed. We should go, Rosie said shakily, melancholic weariness writ large across her face. Algy was silent staring vacantly at a row of bottles as his own sloshed slightly with his heavy breaths. Things weren't going to be okay, were they? It had all happened too quickly, and as much as I wanted to find an anchor point for snark or sarcastic derision, I couldn't find one. There was only dread, foreboding, oily dread that coated my mind like a film, evaporating latent levity as it stained my thoughts. When we left the pub, the street was empty apart from the odd body part or pool of glistening blood. The town was gone, the grass was nibbled, and the fearful herd had moved on. I think the silence was worse than the humming or the whispers, though the walk back to Rosie's was easier. Even so, it was slow, and every now and then I'd catch a bit of movement out of the corner of my eye. Someone sneaking, 
someone hiding, someone watching. We spent the next two days cloistered in Rosie's flat. The whiskey went quickly, as did a bottle of warm champagne that Rosie had been saving for some TBD special occasion. We ate what meager assortment of food she had, hobnobs and beans on toast the first day, and then crisps and packaged frozen tikka masala the second. She had Parcheesi, the royal game of India, and we played it whenever the normalcy of YouTube began to feel too surreal. Between the game and the curry, it was almost possible to believe that we were somewhere far away. And in case you're figuring me for a heartless bastard, I did try my mom and sister. Mom had changed her answer phone message to a garbled monologue of bizarre antelope trivia. A herd of antelope can survive even when only one is breathing. It is the blood of grass that gives the antelope's coat its tawny luster. Things like that. Beck's return SMS message was worse. It simply read, In my womb, a grass seed grows. They were gone swept up in a mental sickness that we had somehow avoided. But during the first night of seclusion, the antelope dreams returned, and I worried over how long our avoidance would last. I was a fetal antelope in the dream, listening to the hum of blood around me as fingers poked and prodded my uterine enclosure. Upon awakening, the thirst for the ferric juice of flesh-cut grass lingered for hours. It was disturbing, but perhaps not as disturbing as the humming the second night and the screams that punctuated the monotonous drone. By the third day, we were out of alcohol, nearly out of food, and Rosie's bouts of chain-smoking had dwindled her supply of Marlboros to a perilous low. It was with the grimness of a gallows goodbye that we joined her in smoking the last three. Afterwards, we would have to leave the prop safety of Rosie's flat and return to where it all started. The new Tesco. It was around half eleven when we finally did, and strangely the prospect of leaving Rosie's one-bedroom nom shelter had me in a passably decent mood. Now, when the hobbits left the Shire in the first Lord of the Rings movie, I remember there being a lightness to their start. Even when they knew they were meant to take a ring to a literal hellscape, the wee fuckers at least seemed to have a modicum of bravery. Rosie retched the moment she opened the door to her flat. I heard the splatter of sick on the ground. It did not quite seem an optimal start for a short walk to the greengrocer. For my part, I had close to no expectation about what we'd find outside. It wasn't a bloody safari into the people part plains of northern England, and it certainly didn't include my very pregnant and entirely too naked sister crouched with a half dozen others around a wide pool of blood. Are they... licking that? Algy asked, swallowing the unpleasantness of the sight halfway through the question. Rosie took a break from spitting on the ground to add, It's almost like a watering hole. Like on the telly. It was exactly like that. I called Beck's name. She didn't respond. But she was alive and safe enough for now, I told myself. I'd be back for her. I'd find out why all this was happening, and then I'd get someone more suitable than myself to fix it. But for the time being, we trudged. From what I could gather, the people of Yeastwick had arranged themselves into two flavors of lunacy. There were antelopes, like my sister, and, and there were blades of grass. Many of the blades of grass seemed to have missing parts, or what looked like bite marks on their thighs and calves. Some had clearly lost too much blood and simply wriggled on the ground instead of swaying. But there were no whole corpses nearby, only parts. I don't know if I had become numb to the carnage or what, but I found myself significantly more disturbed by one consuming thought. Where was the antelope? By the time we had gotten to the new Tesco, I still hadn't seen it, but I could hear Rosie's story just fine as it played through my mind. It almost looked like it was tiptoeing on its tiny little feet. Like it was sneaking. The dodgy deer was just getting dodgier as my paranoia pursued me like its bloody shadow. Algy spotted Remy's Volkswagen in the car park in front of the shop. I'm going to break his window and nick his stash, he said. I don't want to die sober, and I mean, it might be good to have a car. Algy was so wise. And also, he was right about the car thing. We shared a group hug, and then a round of bonding screams. And then we said a bit of mushy rubbish that is and shall ever be a secret. And so, bolstered by the power of love and friendship, Rosie and I held our weapons firmly and proceeded towards our possible doom. Remy greeted us with a cheery, 
Bienvenue, Rosie responded with a curt but incredulous. No. I responded with an irate. You are fucking joking, you mental French twat. He was standing at his kebab cart, and he wasn't acting like an antelope, but he was bloody well dressed like one. Where in the fuck does one even find an antelope onesie, Remy? Tell me now, or I will turn you into fucking grass. He smiled in a perplexed sort of way and answered, Quoi? Tu n'as pas d'encens? French bullshit. He and Cronenberg, 1664, were cut from the same bloody cloth, and if it hadn't been for his meat knife being bigger than mine, I might have done something gruesome. He said you're not making sense, Tommy, Rosie said in a quite surprising comprehension of French. She really was amazing, and Remy really was a twat. I really needed to talk to Mick, so with a practically historical amount of Anglo-French animosity boiling up in my stabbing hand, I stormed off in search of my replacement father figure. I found him in his office in the back, a place I wasn't entirely sure he even knew about. But in this particular quiet rampage through the shop, I actually took note of my surroundings. Much of the literal grass had been replaced with figurative grass. Arms and legs and heaped innards and even a tidy display of heads where the lettuce were usually kept. The latter seemed perversely comical. The lack of beer did not. Mick, explain! I shouted as I found Mick drawing a surprisingly good picture of an antelope riding a nude man like a horse. Hey, Thomas! How lovely of you to visit. Shopping for grass, then? I am not an antelope. I'm a man. I do not eat grass. I eat chips and sausage rolls and lager. None of which you seem to have, because you have seemingly set out to exclusively sell ghoulish fucking nightmares. Mick seemed to consider this for a moment before responding. You seem tense, Thomas. Perhaps a bit of trivia might lighten your mood. He handed me a piece of paper covered in shockingly pleasant calligraphy. Mix top ten facts about antelopes. I read the list. Not one of his facts seemed remotely plausible. But his penmanship was stellar and the list was a gift, so I folded the paper as I glowered at Mick and placed it into my pocket. Mick, I had no idea you were so artistic! I shouted out of pure residual rage. But what the fuck is the antelope and why are you filling the shop with people parts? Mick chuckled coyly. The antelope is a valued customer, Thomas. And a cheeky bit of gossip for you. He might be a secret shopper. To truly understand, you'll need a bit of backstory. The year was 1753, and in Bristol... Mick's psychotic ramble was interrupted by a scream from inside the shop. I surged into action. Tommy! Rosie shouted. I'm coming, Ro... Oh, what the fuck! I tore out of the back office in time to see an abomination that might, in extremely loose terms, be called an antelope, but it was crawling from an open ceiling panel like a bloody spider. Rosie had been bang on about the leg length, but what she had neglected to mention was how decomposed the mangy creature was. Its missing patches of fur and skin gave way to swatches of gangrenous flesh, and the skin of its head was almost entirely rotten away to the bone. As I crossed the shop toward the front, I saw the antelope drop down to an aisle. Then, as I turned a corner and made for Rosie, I saw it settling into a shopping trolley. It began to push the thing forward with its spindly legs, and I wondered for a moment if something like this was just an inevitability for a place like Eastwick. And then I saw Remy, with his meat knife resting on Rosie's throat like a bow of a bloody cello. He was smiling. The shopping trolley squeaked toward us, and I tried to think of a way to stab Rosie to safety. Not finding an obvious course, I opted for diplomacy. Remy, you fuck. You're a vegan. This is assuredly not in line with your core beliefs, right? He furrowed his brow. A vegan? No. I am an antelope. We are herd. unbe fucking leaveable I couldn't stab Remy because he'd kill Rosie. I couldn't leave Rosie because she was a mate. I probably couldn't kill the antelope because it already seemed pretty dead. So I was going to be eaten by an antelope in a shopping trolley in the new bloody Tesco because of the portrayal of a kebab catering not vegan Frenchman in an animal onesie. It was a preposterous way to die, and as I glared back at my approaching executioner, I had a preposterous notion. I rounded on the antelope. Hey, 
you fucking thing. Why are you here, and what the fuck do you want? The antelope squeaked to a stop a few feet away from me and inhaled a long, rattling breath. And then it spoke, with an East London accent. I'm here because deer and horses aren't the only scary animals, it said. What the fuck did that mean? You are a deer. An exotic one, maybe. A dodgy one, certainly. But a deer, mate, through and through. It only had one eye, a milky, deadish sort, but I swear it was judging me. Some would differ on that point, mate. I narrowed my eyes at it. I was not going to be out-snarked by a monster. Not today, and not in the new Tesco. Perhaps this sort of thing might have gone over in the old Tesco. The old Tesco. Oh, I remembered its emolition and began to connect some dots, which brought another notion forward. Perhaps a less preposterous one than the last. Are you like a... a demon? I asked. The antelope shifted in the trolley. No. I momentarily turned back to Rosie, who seemed thoroughly confused, quite frightened, and just a touch entertained. Remy still looked like a twat. Well then, why all the eating people? And people worshipping you, and... Why am I still me and when they aren't? I asked. Well, sometimes antelopes eat meat. Your kind follow me because antelopes are interesting and scary. And you were allowed to roam free because you were already an antelope. You have in your blood a story of lion-related trauma that reverberates through time and marks your soul with the collective anxiety of the herd. Uh, what the fuck's going on? A familiar voice called. I turned to see Algy behind me, eyes bouncing between Remy and the antelope. Algy, things got weird. Weirder, I said, trying to project confidence. And Remy, put down that damn knife, you twat. You heard the monster. I'm basically an antelope chosen one. Remy shrugged and lowered the knife. Rosie turned and kneed him in the groin, and he doubled over. Then Rosie asked a question I hadn't considered in my egotistical pursuit of truth. Why were Algy and I allowed to roam free? I turned back to the antelope who sat motionless and stared for a long moment. Ron and Hermione, isn't it? What the absolute fuck? This monster ate Mary Conover. It turned the town into a hellish blood parade. It made me see my sister naked, and it was making Harry Potter jokes. For the second time in a week, I screamed in the new Tesco, and then I did something unwise. I stabbed the antelope in its milk eye. The antelope let out a rasping chuckle, and then it lowered its head and lurched forward. Fuck. I remember looking down at the horn lodged in my abdomen and thinking, Uh, oh, my dad was killed by a lion. Now I've been killed by an antelope. Where does it end? And then, as everything went black, all I could think of was that song, The Circle of Life. You know, the one from The Lion King. But I didn't die. I awoke from a sleep utterly devoid of antelopian dreams in a hospital bed. Algy was snoring in a chair and Rosie was reading a book. And after a triumphant celebration, including a cheeky Heineken, Rosie passed me a folded piece of paper. Mix beautifully penned antelope rubbish. I've read it, Rosie, I said. There's more on the back, she responded. I think Mick just reused the paper. I flipped it over and saw a note written in what looked like blood. Dear Lucifer, I am the manager of a Tesco in Yeastwick, UK. It has been a decade now since last we attempted to summon a dread emissary from your domain, the attempt at which consumed the former Tesco in a conflagration of hellfire and brimstone. But our town has gone to shit, and I believe it is due to the rise in popularity of our local vicarage and its subduing effect on our pursuit of hedonistic bliss. For that reason, I offer this blood writing and the soul of Remy Lacroix as sacrifice and pray to bring harmonious and animalistic amorality back to our town. The last time you sent a demon, it took the form of a Barbary lion, but I am rather partial to antelopes because they are quite interesting animals. Forever in your cursed thrall, Mick. My mind fixated on the shocking revelation. The antelope lied to me. I asked if it was a demon. It said no. I thought we had a rapport before we exchanged violence, but I guess that was a lie too. What an absolute wanker. 
I silently resolved to never trust an antelope again, French, demonic, or otherwise. But then I continued. P.S. On another note, I was hoping that in time you might see to helping me with a personal issue. I am eternally your servant in damnation, my soul forever bound to the stone of Beelzebub, etc., etc. But for the past six years I have been a hostage of the Tesco Corporation, which I feel is interfering with my subservience to your evil machinations. Please assist at your earliest. Thanks, mate. XO, Mick. Holy shit. I fucking knew it! Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zuall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Larry Ann 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Burt Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, and LaDonna Spivey. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, you'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Characters have already started appearing in stories, so check that out if you're interested. Links to join are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great night.